I would like to thank uh, my friend, my dearest friend, uh, Salman Rao, for the, the invitation to chair this uh, interesting session about uh, six months of uh, COVID-19 in our region. Uh, actually, our region uh, faced the, maybe one of the worst pandemic in its history, maybe especially for our region in North uh, Africa. Uh, what was the preparedness in the, uh, our region? Uh, were the, all the countries at the same stage of preparedness? What were the, was the impact, uh, health impact of uh, COVID-19 COVID and also economical uh, impact and social impact in our region. Uh, I know that we did not have the same health impact, for example, in Tunisia during the first uh, uh, phase wave of the uh, pandemic, uh, the uh, morbidity and the mortality were not very high. Uh, there were no uh, health workers, with few health workers infected by the, uh, by the uh, COVID-19. However, however, the economical impact was very high. Maybe, and according to my husband, who is the economist, he uh, said that one of the highest e economical impact in Tunisia because the lockdown was very, very at the early uh, stage. So. We will discuss now during this session uh, the lessons from the first wave and uh, what are the challenges for the next wave and uh, how to live with the COVID-19 during the uh, next uh, uh, waves or during this wave. And uh, we have uh, two uh, distinguished uh, speakers. The first one is uh, uh, Dr. Abdel Nasser Abu Bakr, who is acting as manager of the uh, infection preparedness unit in, the health, in the, the health emergency program of the World Health Organization of the, our region. Uh, he has more than 25 uh, years uh, experience in, the, uh, in managing infectious disease and the most important uh, 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 pandemic in the region. He will uh, speak about the, uh, the current situation. And also we have our Ismail Ladham, who is a, a representative of the issue in Iraq. And uh, I know him when uh, he was uh, the expert, the regional expert on health technology assessment. Uh, Dr. Abdel Nasser, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Habib. Assalamu alaikum, uh, colleagues. Let me try to share my screen. Okay, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, one of the most uh, important and also prestigious, uh, you know, uh, association in Arab, which is the public health. I think this is my fifth session that I participated, you know, as a, as a participant, but at least this is the first time I'm speaking on behalf of the WHO to give an update on what's happening in the region. Let me start first to give you some uh, global update on COVID outbreak, what's happening. As you can see now on the screen, we have so far as of uh, actually uh, a day ago, 27 million uh, cases. We have reached now 27.5, and we have almost 881,000 deaths, which is 3.3 uh, case fatality ratio, uh, which is quite high as compared to the other, you know, previous uh, outbreaks, including SARS and uh, including the, 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 the other outbreaks, except in MERS and SARS. And you can see that US is the leading uh, country where the majority of the cases have been reported, 6 million. India has overtaken from Brazil. And remember that for the last, for many weeks, actually Brazil was number two, and now India has overtaken. And we have Brazil now who's the, uh, the third country uh, that's reporting more cases than any other country. 
And if you look all the regions in WHO, you can see that you know EMRO actually is the one reporting the fourth uh, region that has the highest number of cases, which is almost two million cases. Next. Now, in how we characterize you know the epidemiological situation in the region. First is we contribute almost 7.4 percent of the global case burden. But that number fluctuates. Sometimes we go up, sometimes we go down. The reason why being is because at the beginning, most of the countries in the region actually were reporting very low uh, trend except to Iran. But I think for the last six weeks, the situation in the region has changed. And now we have a, most of the countries that used to report, used to report very you know, uh, low number of cases and deaths. Now the trend has changed. And now we're seeing more and more countries actually reporting a resurgence or what we call second peak. Uh, all 22 countries are still reporting cases one way or another. And what we have is now 20 million and 20,815 cases and 53,000 deaths and with a case fatality rate of almost uh, uh, two point something percent. The countries in the region that are reporting the largest case load is Iran, which is 20% of the total cases in the region. We have a Pakistan, which is 18% of the cases and we have a KSS Saudi Arabia, which is reporting 18% of the total of the region. That clearly shows that, of course, these countries also have a higher population, uh, but what's missing here is Egypt, which is also reporting a higher number of cases, but not necessarily 18 or 20%, but at least 16%. Now, epidemiologically, you know, in, in, in EMRO, which consists of 22 countries, the first case was confirmed on 29th of January, 2020. Within four weeks, within four weeks after the first case was uh, confirmed, literally all 22 countries in the region, the outbreak have spread very quickly. And what was the driving factor for that quick spread? It was the international travel, which was related to religious mass gathering and the source of infection was Iran, you know, in, in Com City which probably you all know. Nevertheless, I think it's very important to note that in the first three months of the, of the epidemic or the outbreak or the pandemic, majority of the countries in the region actually were relatively experiencing slower transmission. And I think there are many reasons that we can justify why, you know, in the first three, four months, the 22 countries in the region, actually majority of them were reporting low, uh, slower transmission. And I think I can highlight one or two of them in which we think, we don't know exactly, but we think at least in, in this region, that the, there is a factor, democratic factor. There are more young people in this region than other, other countries. And probably at the beginning we were thinking about the weather, but I think now we realize weather is not that much factor because we realize countries like in Iraq, in Egypt, in UAE, and many countries where the temperature reaches over 50 degrees Celsius, now they have the largest number of cases. That clearly shows that maybe the weather wasn't a big factor. During the Ramadan and Eid period, and remember that this is the you know, uh, very important days in, in this region or the Muslim world, the social measurements were relaxed in most of the countries. And that clearly shows that almost 29, 35% uh, a weekly increase of number of cases because of the relaxation because of the Eid and because of the Ramadan. The peak in this region we have reached on the week 25, which is what 14 uh, of July uh, in, in June. And you can see that in the graph that this is the, the time that we have reached the peak. And then the number of reported cases progressively declined over two weeks and then subsequently actually declined in May, in June, July. And then they started picking up again in July. And then we have the, some, most of the countries and some countries in the region have experienced a resurgence of cases and deaths was observed. The reason why being is many countries actually have relaxed. Not only they relaxed and many of them have prematurely relaxed actually without giving any consideration of the WHO recommendations because we have given some recommendations on what are some of the indicators to base, to justify the relaxation. And I think very few countries have used those indicators. Very few countries have used the epidemiology, the health system, as well as other, other related indicators. And that's why we call premature uh, uh, relaxation. But again, we have to look also on the other side because most of the countries also, they have a justification and they will rationalize their reason of opening. 
And this is because of economy. And now if you compare on public health and economy, of course, sometimes saving lives is more important, but also economy become more important. Many people lost their jobs. You know, there was a food shortage. There was a, a many other, you know, uh, act, you know uh, crisis related to economy. And that's why many governments actually have decided to open. And many countries actually have maintained for long term a low uh, R not below 1%, below one, I'm sorry. That clearly shows that the transmission is being controlled. Even some countries until today, actually, after the relaxation of social distancing and even easing the lockdown, they're still maintaining very, very low R not. And I think it's, 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 it's uh, probably, it may not last longer or it may last longer, you know, because it varies from how committed is the government to maintain some of those, you know, uh, restrictions. Now the restrictions have become, some countries they have what they call a smart uh, lockdown or smart restrictions. Probably you don't need to do a national, but you may need to do only localized sub-national level. And in order for you to do that, you really need to monitor and you need to analyze the data so you can identify the hotspot areas. And you need to identify what are the drivers of the outbreak. Is this a tribal related? Is a local transmission? Is a mass gathering related issues? Or is a cross-border movement? You really need to identify the source of infection. And you, in order for you to, that, to do that, you need to analyze the data and you need to understand what's happening and how the transmission is happening. And some of the you know, figures, for example, in this region, the majority of the affected uh, age group is 20 to 65. The proportion male females actually is two to one. Majority of the deaths are about 45%, but also majority of the deaths, either they have one or two comorbidity. Nevertheless, I would like to raise one important point, which is if you divide, if you disaggregate the data between countries with complex emergency and the countries with no complex emergency, you can clearly say that the affected age group varies. For example, the countries with complex emergency, the affected age group is very young, less than 35%, where the majority of the other countries actually, the, the impact of the epidemic actually, it's about 40, uh, 40 years and, uh, and above. Now, the testing capacity. I think the testing plays a very important role on monitoring and also making the decision when it comes to the uh, when it comes to the relaxation and easing the restrictions. In the last eight months, almost three million laboratory PCR tests were conducted in the region. That's what's been reported to WHO. An average region positivity rate is 11.6 percent. We have six countries where the positivity rate is above 20 percent. And I think you understand what, what, what do I mean higher than 20%? Afghanistan, Egypt, Yemen, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen. Why? Because many of these countries actually, they don't follow the case definition. They are testing only severe cases. They are not testing mild cases and also sometimes moderate cases. Their laboratory strategy is focused only for severe cases. Sometimes with the reason, sometimes with no reason. I think there are countries in, like in Somalia, Yemen, probably they don't have enough capacity to handle all this uh, number of tests. Uh, they don't have enough lab capacity, but probably Egypt and Oman, uh, they have capacity, but yet they decided to focus more on severe cases rather than mild cases. Six countries have maintained lower uh, positivity rate of 5%, Bahrain, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Tunisia, UAE. And of course, these countries are those countries that have followed the guidance of WHO and they follow the case definition, which means they tested everyone. And sometimes even outside the case definition, which is the healthy people, the contacts, the healthy contacts. There are five countries in the region that have, have the highest testing level, which is Gulf countries mostly, which obviously uh, because of the resource that they have. Also, there are five countries in the region that have the lowest number of tests, which is the countries with complex emergency, Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, and Syria, and Yemen. I think overall in the region, we have a very mixed uh, situation when it comes to the testing, when it comes to the impact of the pandemic and, and, uh, in those countries. Countries with complex emergencies have reported less cases, where the countries with uh, you know, uh, higher 
economy or maybe mid-level, they have a higher test level, but also they reported more cases. And some of those countries have a lower case fatality rate. For example, Yemen has the highest case fatality rate of, of, of more than 25%, which is extremely very high. Now, this is just to, to show you the epidemic curve of some of the countries. Now, as of this week, we have a number of countries where at the first phase of the outbreak, actually they really did a great job when it comes to the implementation of public health measures and social measures. And they really controlled the outbreak, some of them. But then after they start relaxing uh, the, 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 the restrictions without giving too much consideration of some of the recommendations that WHO have provided, because we have given them some indicators to look for it. For example, if you maintain uh, 14 days lower than R0, uh, one, less than 1%, or if you maintain low positivity rate, or if you maintain, you know, we have given them some indicators. A number of countries actually have not followed those uh, guidance and those recommendations. They have opened prematurely, and actually some of them, they pay the price. And look what happened now. And, uh, for example, in Iraq, I know my colleague uh, Adam will uh, speak more details. Look in Jordan, they really controlled the outbreak at the beginning. They had only 3,000, 4,000 cases. Look what happened for the last three, four weeks in, in, in the far right. And also Libya. I think Libya is one of our uh, countries that we are really concerned. And uh, I think by June, by the beginning of July, that one we, we see the peak is starting. And now they are reporting at least 3,000 uh, per, uh, per week, uh, per day sometimes. And that's, and remember the complexity of Libya. You know, they have a testing uh, challenge because they don't have enough testing, but yet those three or four labs that they have, they overwhelm. The hospitals were overwhelmed. Lebanon also, which is more reasonable because of the blast in Beirut. I think that's because the health system were disrupted. And that's why we see the resurgence of cases Kuwait also, we see that, you know, uh, cases are picking up as well. Another group of countries where we see uh, the major peak is Morocco. I think you can see on the, on the left side uh, on the first row that you can see that after, you know, the second week of July, the, the trend has skyrocketed. The hospitals are full. The ICU capacity, uh, you know, it's overwhelmed. Well, most of the referral hospitals in the capital as well as outside capital. The testing, the, the number of tests has increased. And how it happened and why? I think we need to ask, this is a very good question that we really need to ask because it will help for other countries as well. As much as countries have prematurely uh, lifted the, 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 the restrictions on the lockdown, many countries actually have opened the, the airports and international travel and local travel. And I think Morocco, Tunisia, some other countries, the reason why we have the resurgence is because of the travel. And most of the introduction, reintroduction actually originated either from Europe or from some other countries. And that is some good lesson that those countries that, I think in Morocco now they have reimposed restrictions, same thing with Morocco, same thing with Jordan, same thing with Lebanon. Most of the countries they reimpose. It may not be as same as the previous one, but I, I think now Sudan also is another country where it's currently, uh, we, are, uh, we are seeing a minor resurgence in the last two, three weeks. Same thing with the United Arab Emirates. We have also. So this is the group of countries where we have eight countries where we or nine countries where we really have a major resurgence of cases, and what, this is what we call second peak uh, of the uh, of the epidemic. Now we have also another countries that really have maintained low level. At the beginning, the 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 trend was very high, and then they really put together a proper uh, intervention, and then they maintain. Afghanistan, Djibouti, Egypt, Oman and also Pakistan. Of course, Iran is an outlier, and you can see that for the last few weeks it's been stabilized, but it still is very, it's very high. At least they are reporting 1,000, 1,500, and 2,000 per day, while the mortality is very high still in, Morocco, in, in Iran. But look in Afghanistan, which is a complex emergency. It's, uh, it's amazing the work that's been done in that country, and they managed to control. Literally, you know, they maintain less than one uh, R0 uh, for many weeks. Same thing in Djibouti, they have a very good contact tracing system. They have a very good, you know, uh, social mobility, risk communication pro, uh, activities and they manage. And uh, Egypt, of course, you know, it's, it's a 1 million question. We discussed this before. I think Egypt currently, there's a small peak that have started 
and we advise the country actually they really need to take more precaution measures, at least, uh, you know, uh, implementing some restrictions or even promoting or really enforcing the, the, the implementation of some of the social measures, such as physical, physical distancing, the use of masks and related. Pakistan, one, the third, one of the countries that, the second country that's reporting the majority of the cases in the region, now look how they control the, uh, the epidemic. They are reporting very few cases while they are maintaining very high level of testing uh, ratio, which is very good. Nevertheless, in Pakistan, I don't know how much you know, I think the physical distancing and social measures actually is non-existent, it's very limited. So sometimes you're surprised if there is no proper uh, public health intervention is being implemented, such as physical distancing and social measures, why the outbreak is being controlled? I think that's a question that we need to ask all the public health experts to understand what's happening in Pakistan, as well as many other countries. Egypt also is the same thing, question. Qatar, Saudi Arabia, I think Yemen, these are all downturn trend. And, and, and I think this is what, uh, the, uh, what we are seeing in those countries, how long they can maintain only God knows, but we are advising them to, to take uh, more pro precautions measures. I think if, if, if you know, uh, in, in some of those countries, we, we are trying to tell them that they really need to learn some lessons from other countries who are experiencing the second peak. And one of those lessons is they need to maintain public health intervention, the testing, the contact tracing, the isolation, the, the management of cases, but also the social, the social measures uh, the physical distancing need to be, uh, you know, reinforced. The face mask, it's very important. And we have seen some of the modeling that's been done recently in US, in Europe, and also some other countries. It can, it can save lives and it can prevent and it can slow down the, the spread of infection. And this is what we are telling the countries. These are the basic, uh, you know, uh, epidemiology or basic public health interventions that they really need to maintain or to continue implementing those. Now, just to share with you some of the notable events that happened in our region in the last eight months. First, Iran has become the second uh, epicenter when it comes to the spread of infection. I think if you remember that it was a mass gathering, religious mass gathering in Qom, and majority of the countries in this region, actually, the outbreak um, uh, was related to travel related to that mass gathering. Not only for our countries in the region, but also a number of other countries in worldwide that have spread the outbreak. Also another notable event is Hajj and Umrah suspension. This was a very decisive decision by the Saudi government. And I think that has helped Saudi Arabia to, to limit the spread of this infection at the beginning. But of course, there was also many other factors that contributed such as the migrants. Closure of the mosque and churches. I think it probably for many years, this is the first time in the whole region uh, where mosques and churches were closed for many months. This is unprecedented decision, uh, leadership decision, or what we call decisive leadership decision. Also the Beirut portoplast impact, which is actually, it's evident in Beirut, what's happening in Beirut currently, that they have more cases and more deaths because uh, the, the, the blast has actually uh, negatively impacted and disrupted the healthcare services. The role of migrant dormitories in explosive outbreaks in Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Qatar, UAE, Bahrain. I think it, we, have, we see more and more uh, migrants uh, as compared to the nationality being infected. That's the first phase of infection. But I think now the situation has changed and there are more nationalists than, than migrants. Hospital outbreaks with increased uh, healthcare workers infection. I think in a number of countries in our region, we see that more healthcare workers were infected and many uh, uh, frontline health workers died for this infection. Also, we have a mixed epidemiological situation in the region. We have a low attack rate overall in the region as compared to the other, other regions. We have a young demographic uh, and, and, and age group in this region. That's why we have low uh, trend at the beginning and maybe even now. Refugees and IDP camps is less affected most of the countries where there is a refugee and IDP camps, actually there's less cases in the camps. Syria and, and Lebanon, Somalia and, and, and Libya, Yemen and, and Afghanistan. I think we have evidence that you know, there's less cases. And of course, maybe there's, there's obvious reason because the camps are actually isolated, they're closed and there is no international travel related to the camps. And that's why maybe we have less cases. 
We also have a weak health system and low capacity to respond in some of the countries. For example, complex emergency countries, they have a low testing capacity, but also they have a less ICU beds and also less uh, uh, health system capacity to, 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 to handle the, the cases. What are some of the progresses that we made in the region in the response? Of course, the regional leadership actually clearly showed the number of countries and in the region in WHO, we really did our, the leadership of the regional director, the senior management, as well as our WR, they really led, uh, supported the countries and they really provided the need technical support. There are a number of teleconference with the ministers. There's a number of technical discussions with the MOH staff and we engage uh, regional technical advisory committee and we make sure that all countries actually receive the necessary technical support that they need. We also provided operational support and logistics and we have a Dubai hub uh, that have facilitated you know, the procurement and also facilitated the shipment of all supplies in most of the countries in the region. Almost 18 million BBEs and 380,000 kits, which is means millions of diagnostic kits were distributed to the region as well as outside the region. We also concentrated technical support to the countries. We have done technical missions to almost eight countries, rather nine countries. We set up technical support to the countries. Each country have a, a five or six technical staff who are dedicated for those countries. We have almost 55 search deployment to the countries and we continue supporting virtually to all countries in the region. We also have a collaboration with partners in the region where, when it comes to the uh, academia, when it comes to the partners, when it comes to the other UN agencies and also the GON uh, partners. We are really collaborating with partners in the region in order to provide technical support to our member states. We also try to leverage the existing capacity which polio, as well as the influenza and other emergency capacities. Polio staff has been repurposed in a number of countries. The early warning surveillance countries, actually they repurposed the, the system. The influenza surveillance infrastructure, the lab, the NICs have been used effectively, but also all the rapid response teams that have been trained for influenza as well as other diseases, they have been repurposed and they've been utilized to investigate and respond to COVID. We also expanded the laboratory capacity, not only the national level, but also sub-national level. As we speak right now, we have a 300 lab centers across the region, which is an you know, uh, unexpected number of cases and uh, lab. At the beginning of uh, the outbreak, we only had 35. And look, now we have 320. In Yemen, Libya, even countries with complex emergencies, we managed to expand the network. We also have an intensive uh, uh, quality control that, that in place, not only the nationals, also sub-nationals. We already completed the nationals and, the, and the, the quality control and all countries in the region actually have performed uh, very high efficacy and very high uh, 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 quality control. Now, in order for us to maintain you know, a good quality intervention, we set up a, a very strong monitoring and evaluation to the response. We, have, we set up indicators to monitor, we have a health system indicators, and also we have a public health surveillance indicators in which we ask all countries, they need to use these indicators to monitor the situation. And then they can decide if they're actually uh, 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 meeting uh, the, what they intend to do. For example, we have the number, we have the, uh, the level of uh, positivity rate. And I think we have, we said that less than 5%, that's acceptable. If it's above that, that means you are not testing enough number of, uh, of, of, of people, or maybe you're focusing only for the severe cases. For example, the contact tracing, the number of ILI samples tested and related uh, issues like I ICU capacity and everything. So these are the indicators that we provided and these indicators are still valid. Uh, most of the countries now they're moving to the second phase and they're experiencing on uh, second big and still majority of these indicators are valid. But again, we also need to revise and adapt in the context of each country and come up new indicators to monitor the situation. Of course, you know, uh, we have many successes, but also we have a number of challenges in this region. And some of those uh, challenges include the weak, weak health system, and also weak surveillance system capacity in the region, especially the countries with complex emergency. And because of that, number of countries, they are really finding difficult to cope the resurgence of cases. I think in, in Morocco, which has 
one of the best health system in the region. It's, uh, they, they are really suffering. They are really trying to cope the overwhelming uh, ICU uh, demand. Same thing also other countries in the region. And I'm sure Iraq, uh, you know, Atam will talk about it, Lebanon, Jordan, and a number of other countries. We also reduce, because of the pandemic, the access to essential health services has been reduced and the impact of essential health services is obvious. We have immunization rate has declined. The, you know, the, the morbidity and mortality for other diseases actually has increased. And, 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 and hospital admission for any other diseases have declined because most of the hospitals have been used for COVID. And now that's why in WHO we are really advocating that all countries need to give more emphasis to essential health services. I'm sure Dr. Salman will talk about primary health care. And I think that's what we really need to focus now in order to save more lives. Inadequate investment in risk communication. I think this is a key element that at the beginning, at the first phase that many countries did not invest enough. But right now we really need to see how we can invest more on risk communication and behavior change at national and subnational level. We also, many countries are still experiencing shortage of supplies, whether it's a testing, whether it's a ventilators, whether it's a, a, a other medical supplies. Also, we are facing some limited information and data sharing in some member countries. And also countries are not sharing information across border collaboration. It's very limited. Suboptimal testing strategy exists in a number of countries, especially those countries who are experiencing resurgence of cases. If, if you see that the, you know, the, the trend of the lab, um, uh, the trend of the lab ratio, you can see that number of countries who are experiencing the resurgence, actually the lab testing is going down one way or another. Also the contact tracing is a major issue and number of countries are not doing enough contact tracing. And this is the right time. For most of the countries to do the effective contact tracing, especially if you manage to control and you want to really trace any new infection, then this is the best approach for you to identify the contacts, monitor them, isolate them, and at least make sure that there's no uh, local uh, community spread. And finally, we have uh, most of the many countries actually have lifted prematurely the public health restrictions and also lockdown. For example, point of entry has been opened, some schools, and also some uh, uh, religious gatherings, uh, like what happened in Jordan. I think it is what have triggered the resurgence of cases are mass gathering, and maybe what happened in Ashura in some of the countries. That's also uh, some of the challenges. What are some of the lessons that we learned? Of course, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Abdelnas, you have two minutes. Thank you. I will. I think we have a number of uh, uh, lessons that we learned. Of course, you know the uh, uh, the lifting of lockdown to the economic pressure. Also, there is no evidence, but at least this whole society and also whole uh, government uh, approach that's been implemented in most of the countries. We are also probably facing a second peak of the outbreak, and we really need to be ready. Uh, it's inevitable that all countries, one way or another, they will experience the second big, and we have to be prepared to the worst. We need to maintain aggressive testing, and also we really need to increase the risk communication. Conclusion, I think COVID cases will continue to be reported most of the countries in the region, and really we don't know exact, exactly the trajectory in the region in the coming weeks and months, but what we think is if the situation continues and countries continue to experience a second big, and also the influenza, the schools are opening, as well as other uh, factors, probably we might see more cases and more deaths. Several countries now they're experiencing upsurge of cases after relaxation. The reopening of the schools this month might increase and also more increase in mobility. That's also is a concern for WHO as well as for the countries. And we really need to give more emphasis on the schools. Testing rates are declining and we really need to change the trend and we need to test more people. The adherence and the perception of the uh, uh, risk is reducing due to the fatigue among the community and we need to change and we need to have a, a strong risk communication. And also the pandemic is impacting the accessibility and availability of essential health services and we really need to give more. And finally, we really need to have a strong leadership and also partnership. And that's the only way we can achieve and we can control the pandemic. Cross-border collaboration, information sharing and also learning from each other of experience. Thank you very much. And these are some of the discussion questions that I would like to pose to the, uh, my colleagues. What, the, what will be the impact of a school opening? And what will be the interaction between influenza season and COVID in the next few weeks and months? What about the low face mask use in the region? 
what will be the impact, and also declining test and how to scale up essential health services. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdel Nasser. Thank you very much indeed for the excellent presentation. You highlight the simil similarities, but also the differences between the country. And you, you explain why we have the different uh, differences in the situation, especially on the uh, 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 policy of testing and uh, co contact tracing, and also you pointed the uh, channels for the next, uh, uh, for this way. Uh, we will come back to the uh, questions that you raised, and uh, the floor is uh, to uh, Dr. Ladham Esmail. The floor is yours. Your mic is. Uh... Thank you, Your Excellency. It's been a pleasure. Uh, it's a real pleasure having to present in front of your good self, uh, as someone who's always admired his uh, her managerial skills in leading the healthcare in Tunisia. It's also a pleasure being and seeing Dr. with uh, and seeing Dr. Tofi Khoja, uh, who's uh, of course one of the eminent figures in the Gulf region, and of course Professor Salman is. Um, is, uh, is, uh, is one of my uh, role models in leading the public health um, in not in Imperial College, but also across the whole, the entire Arab world. Let me start by saying, uh, dear Abdel Nasser, can you please, if you can please uh, quit your screen, sharing your screen so that I can share mine, please, uh, if it's possible. Sure, I, I think I'm having some difficulty to change, but just to maybe. Uh, I don't know. Can you see mine now? No. I... Can you see my screen now, Any, everyone? No, no, no. We don't see it. Then, uh, Dr. Nasser, you should uh, yeah. please. That's yes, nice. That's fine. Now no, we can. It's fine. it's fine. Now it's fine. Okay, very, very good. Then I will start my uh, presentation going through uh, the same topic, which is going through six months of COVID in Iraq. Some lessons there. Maybe Abdel Nasser gave you a, a general overview of how things look like from regional perspective. But if you shed some light on Iraq and its vast, ex I would really say vast experience in the, least, in the last six months because we've passed through thick and, uh, and thin and we've went through from doing good to doing bad to slow down and God knows what will happen next. So it's been a, like, a, I always uh, um, say it's like a roller coaster ride for us full of knowledge and full of lessons learned. Let me, um, um, let me start by, uh, uh, by first uh, um, uh, giving, uh, um, the, the, I'm sorry. The, let me start by giving you first, how uh, did we pass through all of this? Actually, uh, from the first case in Iraq on the 24th of February, before that, we had no cases at all, but we did take some measures in anticipation that the virus is coming into the land. But from that, those measures help us in, in, in prolonging the sporadic phase of transmission that is usually accompanied travelers and people coming from abroad. But of course, as you as always said in many countries, no country has control over 100% of its borders. This might lead to uh, uh, the spread of the virus um, uh, from uh, uh, and, and its transfer um, uh, you know, in, from not only carried by travelers, but start transferring into the communities. First, it is in the hand, in the, uh, so we stayed in this sporadic phase from February up to the 10th of May. In our estimation from the 10th of May, which is along almost mid-Ramadan, where people decided to go to the streets, uh, come out of the lockdown and decided to celebrate the last 10 days in Ramadan, also Eid al-Fitr, has all resulted in moving into the second phase of transmission, which is some clusters that has been identified in major cities in Iraq. But that cluster phase did not last long. And because the in-country travel between governorates was not stopped, and because of many religious gatherings and social gatherings that hasn't been banned or fined properly on the ground, this has moved us very quickly, I would say early June, 
into phase three, uh, which which was close to Eid al-Adha, before Eid al-Adha and after, into the community phase transmission, which is phase three, the one that we are currently seeing now. You can see the blue curve and how it went from being slowed down very aggressively at the beginning into exponential rise. But again, I would be happy to say that, again, our interventions has led even to the, some slowdown on the progress of the virus in the last few days. But who knows what will happen next with Arba'in and Ashura last week and Arba'in and, uh, you know, Arba'ini visit uh, in the beginning of October. Who knows how this curve will look like. Let me... Uh, let me move into the infectious status. The first phase I said, the sporadic. When we first uh, uh, were discussing the issue with the Minister of Health, we said, Your Excellency, we did uh, an international, through, uh, you know, an, a joint external evaluation exercise, uh, which is part of the IHR, uh, uh, International Health Regulation, which Iraq signed and has never done. In 2019, Dr. Ala Alwan, um, public health gurus and my mentor, has uh, uh, invited the emergency department of WHO to come and assess Iraq's preparedness and response to any emergency. And at that time, all of the indicators showed that, that Iraq is not very much prepared. We did put an emergency plan that was endorsed by almost August 2019, but unfortunately, uh, demonstrations erupted in the street in October, followed by the COVID-19 outbreak, so that uh, plan was never uh, implemented uh, properly. So therefore, when the, when the COVID broke, I told His Excellency, the minister at that time, uh, Dr. Alwan uh, stepped down, Dr. Jafar Allawi came in, and we agreed that the only thing possible, because we have an ailing health system from years of conflict, is to stop the virus from coming to Iraq. So we, we pursued a very aggressive preventive strategy uh, uh, at all costs, Trying and our our vision at that time is to flatten, try to flatten the curve, prolong the time, so that we buy ourselves four or five months that we can uh, that we can strengthen our health system, increase the number of beds, increase the lab capacity, and so on, so that we don't see uh, people falling in the streets like we've seen in Europe and many other places. And that was uh, the strategy. And accordingly, we took the following measures. A ban to travel to China on the 29th of January. Uh, evacuation of Iraqi students from Wuhan, not involving any cases and, and quarantining them properly, but no one was infected anyway on the 5th of February. On the 20th of February, we had zero cases at that time. We banned the flights from many countries, but I specifically want you to look at, and I'm not picking, but Iran, Kuwait, both had high numbers at that time, both are neighboring countries, and also Turkey, I think at a later stage, we prevented citizens from coming in. Unfortunately, we have many entry points that we are not aware of, uh, I, I would say illegal, and there were, so, well, there were some uh, people coming in. Um, before the ban decision, uh, an Iranian student in Najaf was studying in Najaf, he uh, uh, came back to, to finish his studies, in, his studies in Najaf from Iran with the uh, infection, and that was the first case reported on the 24th of February. He actually collapsed. Actually, Iran embassy uh, drove him back to Iran, and we heard that he died. So the first case that entered Iraq was really lethal. And when we did the contact tracing on that subject, it turned out that he at least contacted 100 people in Najaf, and from there on, we were on a roller coaster. We tried so heavily to, uh, four cases afterwards were reported in Kirkuk. Schools and universities we closed on the 21st of March. At that time, we had only five cases. Then KRG started reporting the first six cases, Kurdistan uh, government uh, in the north, and their own country very quickly closed completely the borders with Iran on the 15th of March and went into a, a lockdown for a month from the 17th of March till April. The, all of this period, at the end of this uh, period, we only had close to uh, uh, 1,500 cases. So we managed for almost uh, two months uh, and more to keep the numbers at a, at a minimum level. The case fatality rate was close to 5%, but that's because the numbers in our, uh, were low. In our estimation, Iraq's strategy, if we had left 
the virus spreading without closing the borders, without taking all of these measures, we would have seen an, a, a rapid exponential rise uncontrolled, which is explained by the dotted line one. But because we closed the borders, because we prevented mass and religious gatherings as well, because we imposed curfews and closed airports, the curve was the orange one that you've seen number four. In our estimation at that time, in those two or three months, we've prevented more than a million infection, at least uh, if we uh, have measured this. Um, as of the 10th of May, which is almost uh, three months after the infection, Iraq had only 2,700 cases. Iraq had a case fatality rate of 3.9%, recovery rate of 63%, which were average or you know comparable to global and regional uh, averages. And um, uh, the number of infected per million population of Iraq was 71, which was among the lowest in the region. Even uh, within the region, if you look, uh, uh, we were almost in the middle of the region. We had Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Qatar, UAE reporting more numbers than us. And as you can see, we even had at that time in May, uh, uh, very good indicators. And our position was actually uh, in a very good shape. What happened? What went wrong? What went wrong is that we moved from sporadic to community transmission very quickly, passing through clustered in a short term. One of the rules when I discussed with Professor Salman at that time, when we opened discussion on how to open up, he told me that there is you know, uh, an article explaining how countries should come out of the lockdown. They include many indicators, public health indicators, some community acceptance measure, public health measures, and health system uh, uh, capacity measures. If we look at the public health indicators, they were really conducive at that time. As I told you, low number of infections, doubling rate was more than two weeks. The, the, the growth rate was, uh, was, uh, was at that time less than one. Incident rate was declining. The community acceptance of the measures was the problem. There was no economic package coming with those lockdowns and these measures that we have done. People were fed up, people with a low number of cases, people were not seeing COVID cases around them and began to say to each other, there's nothing called COVID. We are penalizing our families. We are decreasing our income for nothing. And they started coming out. At that time, we were increasing hospital capacity. But again, I would, I, I would really want you to think that globally, everyone was asking for the same thing, beds, ventilators, PPEs, uh, COVID-19 kits. So it was so hard to find. We've managed as WHO and the country to bring as much as we can, increase as much as we can. But I, I would say we still needed more. What happened is that with those conducive public health indicators that allowed us to open up, people should have done and everyone should have taken his responsibilities. People should have practiced hand hygiene, uh, 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 social distancing, and wearing masks. Did not happen in a good way. Even Nasser said that in his presentation, and he's right. The people are not, are not following those. Government should have really strictly closed the borders, imposed fines on people who, uh, who breach the rules and regulations regarding gatherings, uh, develop a fast-track procurement mechanism, procedures, control the private clinics, and so on. But the government did not do that because of many reasons. They were really uh, somehow reluctant to take those decisions. The Ministry of Health should have increased the testing capacity, done an active surveillance and contact tracing in a better manner, adhered to WHO clinical protocols, and did some awareness campaigns, ma massive awareness campaigns and fundraising campaigns as well. These were done in a very limited manner despite our push for, 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 and I would give you an example, the clinical protocol was only revised by WHO. The, the new minister just two months back created an advisory committee uh, uh, Dr. Salman and I are part of, and uh, only then the clinical pr pr protocols were refined and it gave us a very good result. But we keep pushing for the protocols, but they, of course, as you know, the ministry is imposing their own built on experiences of other people or other countries that they're listening to. Hospitals should have done some at least elementary infection prevention control measures, try to increase bed capacities and, and, and things. They did that, but not enough in our uh, own assessment. The media 
was only about uh, TV ads and, and programs and interviews. Nothing was done on the ground as a behavioral change media strategy. But it's all, we're all, we're all messages. Even debunking myths was not happening because media was, was, was even contributing to, to these myths. Like, like, for example, the latest you've heard and you will laugh, wearing masks make you uh, suck uh, carbon dioxide in front, uh, instead of oxygen and you will die. Would you, do you believe that such a myth has been reported to be said by us, WHO, and I have to go and go against that? Every day we are debunking myths in Iraq, especially over social media. Local manufacturers should have started earlier production of PPEs, and, and, and we do have some innovative solutions on VTMs, viral transport media, in Masra University. It started, but not to the extent that it will really uh, cover all needs. And finally, universities up to this moment have not, have not offered their labs and, 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 and PCR machines if they're to support the Ministry of Health in doing more testing. Uh, right now, we are speaking about it and it's being done. This is exactly what happened. And you can see the, the curve from the 26th of May. I have just focused on that part till end of June, how it started instead of linear, I would say straight line, progressing exponentially uh, from uh, to show you that in just 18 days, our numbers quadrupled from 5,000 to almost 20,000 in 18 days. We kept adding numbers because of this. The third phase is the community phase, uh, transmission phase. From that on, from that moment in June, mid-June, I would say, up to this moment, we've been trying to control the progress of the curve. We've managed to put some limits on the daily numbers of infections and put hold in it, trap it between three to 4,000 or even 5,000 a day, but that's not enough. We need to bring it down. Yes, strategy of community phase transmission is to bring down the numbers that climbed from 18,000 to 270,000 in just uh, uh, three months, but we need to bring them down. We managed to slow them down, but every time we make progress, a gathering would come or an opening, uncontrolled opening by the government is uh, we are surprised with that makes, puts us back a step back and then we readjust and try to, to come forward. It's a roller coaster. A few days ago before Ashura visit, I was so happy that we start to control and slow down the number of infections. Ashura came, religious scholars invited people to gather and go because, you know, uh, these, uh, the, these places are sacred. No one will get infected. Guess what? We are expecting a rise in the number of infections because of this gathering. And we always said if Hajj was canceled, then any other visit can be canceled. But unfortunately, no one is listening to us. This is a glimpse of what's happening, and probably many of those indicators have been mentioned by Nasser, but I, I, I want to highlight a few, uh, few of them because really numbers, without translating them into, into meanings, has no value for me. For example, uh, I would tell you that from the daily number that you would see, that Iraq is actually doing exceptionally well in the number, in the cure rate and the death rate. We managed by um, Re, uh, uh, Dr. Salman and I managed to talk to so many people after Eid al-Fitr in May, explaining that we are in community, we need to restructure the whole governance of COVID in the country. We managed to do that by meeting the president, calling the prime minister. And in doing that, we created a body, a very scientific body that has looked into hospital performance and drug uh, uh, regimens in hospitals. And we managed to improve the cure rate from lower than 50% to 76% in a couple of months and to lower, uh, to, to, sorry, to, to increase the, uh, the cure rate and to lower the mortality rate from five point something into, into today, 2.8%. This is exceptional. So this means that hospitals are doing better. So what we can control, we did better. The problem with the infection and daily number of infection is attitude, something beyond our control. Implementation on the ground, which is weak, I would say, and compliance by the people, which is also weak. But the, the uh, rules and regulations and the directives coming out from the ministry and higher committee that was established to manage COVID across the country was really good. ICU patients are only around 500 cases in this, which is 1% of the active cases in this country. So this means that not so many patients are in the ICU uh, uh, actually compared to 200 
compared to almost 55,000 cases active, only 1% uh, is in the eye intensive care. Male to female ratio is 60 to 40%. Most of the people infected are between 30 to 40 years. This is a message that these people do not care. They think that because they are, have good immunity, they think that nothing will happen to them. And it's just like a common cold. And guess what? They're the most infected. And they go back and infect uh, their fathers and mothers. And most of the people who die are actually from 50 to 60 years old through uh, the uh, transmission. But that alone, because it's cosmopolitan, accounts for 30% of the cases, almost followed by southern governments like Basra, Kirbala, Wasit, and Najaf, because of their proximity to Iran and the religious ties to them, and Soleimaniya, also a border country to Iran. And the daily number of deaths has been plateauing less than 100 since mid-July. I explained this is because of the efforts that we've done uh, in restructuring uh, the governance uh, of the COVID. For the first time since the start of the community transmission, the weekly number of cases and mortalities have decreased, uh, showing almost a slowdown in the progress of the virus. And we have incidence rate per 100,000 in Kerbala, which is a sacred Shia city, 1,200, the highest, followed by Wasit, Muthanna, and Najaf. Again, all of them are in the south. Uh, the incidence rate. Uh, mortality rates are the highest in Soleimaniya, 4.8%. And this because they opened up to the trade and tourism with Iran without any restrictions, without imposing any kind of measures. Followed by the Qar, Kirkuk, Babel. The lowest was the Hook, which is a border country to Turkey. Uh, highest cure rate was in Diyala, the Qar, Babel, Baghdad, showing and the lowest cure rate is in the hook. So the hook is the lowest cure rate and the lowest uh, mortality rate. And uh, the case of the hook is now is on, is on uh, an exponential rise. Maybe these numbers will change in the uh, very soon. 59% of those who die in Iraqi hospitals die within two days of being admitted. This means that they arrive very late to the hospital because of the distrust of the, or the mistrust in the public facilities. The running uh, rumor is that don't go to hospitals, you will be dead there. So they try to um, cure themselves at home, seeking advice of private physicians or their own selves. Some of them are getting drug regimens from the internet and trying to do that. And when, it's, and when they cannot breathe anymore, they just go to the hospital, guess what? Too little, too late. 26% of them die within one week. The problem with COVID, is the long stay and the long occupancy of beds by patients in Iraq that doesn't exist. This explains why that bed occupancy rate in this country, despite the high number of infections, is actually less than 50%. 28% of the cases died from the uh, cardiovascular disease and 25% died from no other comorbidity. So they had nothing and they just died. And my astonishment, 1% only had cancer of those who Doctor, died. Dr. Ladam, excuse me, we have to... Yes. Um, a few minutes for the discussion. Absolutely. I will, I will wrap up in one minute. So these are uh, among hospitalized cases, only 5% need oxygen, critical cases, 20% need ventilators, and 50% needed CPAPs. And then the indicators, the doubling rate, the infection rate, and others. But I would only would say that the growth rate in Iraq right now is 1.05. So it's not bad. The growth rate is close to one. We need it less than one. But there has been an up, it, unfortunately, it was lower than one before uh, Ashura, after Ashura, there's an upward trend expected. And these are the countries that you have. Also, I want to finalize by saying that WHO also manages um, 43 camps, hosting refugees, IDPs, totally managed. The, uh, 20 of those camps have been infected by 65 cases, only two died, and 26 are currently active. Uh, in those. So finally, I would go very quickly, the type of support, we have supported the government in all kinds, preparedness and response, coordination and collaboration with agencies and donors, risk communication, media uh, uh, campaigns, ground campaigns, media interviews. I have made personally over 30 interviews on TV. Uh, um, uh, we had, have a Twitter, Facebook page that is followed by thousands, technical guidance and training we have conducted. Right now, we are conducting border control training for people, testing and verification. At a point of time, we are the only providers of kits in this country until uh, the contract for the country kicked in with millions of kits. But there comes a time where we were doing that. We even 
uh, encouraged in, uh, innovative solution of production of VTMs in Basra and other, we have, and we helped in inaugurating four labs. And now the number of labs have increased to almost 42 labs in the country. All of this has been done through a, a good logistic and supply that provided all the needed equipment and all the PCR. And finally, also we have followed some essential, this was on the side of following some essential things like uh, uh, the, uh, the other WHO services like immunization and others has not been overlooked. But I want to also say that our role in border control and mass gathering and the prevention of mass gathering was really something that we maybe talk about later or, in, or we go through in, uh, in our questions. I will um, stop with these two slides, the final two slides, that what are our perceived gaps for the future? And this is the purpose of this uh, we we webinar. First, the governance. We think that the governance should be uh, really monitored and changed in terms of more border control, more monitoring and evaluation from the ministry. There has to be a fast track procurement mechanism uh, because people are really afraid uh, in buying things by direct purchase. Uh, uh, and in the era of logistics of, of emergency, this is becomes our life becomes difficult. The relation with the Kurdistan region has to be improved in order to unify the efforts. Transmission and infection prevention control should be really looked at. Hospitals lack IPC measures. They're very weak. This is something we need to focus on. There has been a weak health services provided. Primary health care should be involved in our response. Private sector also has to be engaged in a proper way under control of the government. Workforce has to increase. We have more innovative, uh, the number of physicians are not acceptable, uh, especially with the current rise. The uh, essential health services lack of uh, some proper public health measures. Number of labs have to increase in order to detect more and go into the active surveillance and contact tracing in a much better way. Lab supplies are really uh, not there. We public acceptance of measures is something that we have to look at. Last week, I was in Soleimania trying to, to tell people, wear your mask, and they just didn't like it. They don't want to. So the acceptance of those measures have to come, and the debunking myth is, is something that we have to work on. Finally, everything has to come through economic packages. So these are my fo the way forward is that we have to do something about wearing mask strategies. We have to prevent somehow the super transmission events and the super event uh, events and, 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 and gatherings which can lead to 57% reduction of infections. They have to have strict border control measures, increase our testing capacity, conduct active surveillance and contact tracing in a better way, enforce more IPC measures in the future, increase our capacity of risk communication and public awareness, improve the surveillance data, which is still done manually. We want it to be digitized and unified across Iraq, which was not the case. Proper isolation and clinical management uh, in hospitals, and finally, involving the private sector. And I thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Redham, for this uh, presentation. You described the situation in Iraq, but also you, you discussed the role, the important role of WHO, the commitment of WHO in Iraq, but also in the uh, Dr. Salman, do we have uh, some uh, a few minutes for the discussion or not? We have, we have limited time, about less than half an hour. We will we'll try to do our best. We have, we have a lot of questions, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Habiba. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdi Nasser. Uh, I'm really grateful to your presentation mm -hmm. and to uh, Dr. Adham. Thank you. Thank you very much to choose this a specific case example because we learned a lot from it and it's so specific and I'm, I'm really so grateful we have general view and specific zooming on one country which is most of most or more or less reflection of other countries well done um uh, i think we got a list of question uh, professor hoja got a list of question too but let me let me start by teasing the topic and saying I strongly believe now, honestly, from what I receive from across the region, there is so much ignorance about the coronavirus and COVID-19 among health professionals. Because still people appear on television and talking nonsense. Absolutely. And we have to stop this. I don't know how. You know, this is not happening across Europe at all. And you may or may not know 
uh, know that that uh, uh, early in the pandemic, somebody appeared on the British television and he was struck by the General Medical Council because they felt what he said wasn't true and a professional and he should not continue to practice. Is it worth developing courses on COVID for our colleagues across the region? I mean, we could help, we could work with colleagues at WHO. Today uh, or yesterday, WHO launched courses on COVID and primary care, excellent step. But this is mainly for primary care. There is so much ignorance at hospital level. There is so much ignorance among public health colleagues and, and uh, uh, non-medical colleagues, um, uh, nursing, etc. So what's your opinion, uh, Abdi Nasser? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salman. I think he, you know the point that you raise is a, is a very important and critical in our region, as well as outside the region. And I think in the, uh, as you rightly said, in the last eight months, WHO has developed almost over 100 uh, courses just to make sure that we train and we provide the most up-to-date information to healthcare workers, to frontline healthcare workers. Of course, you know, uh, often. Uh, we are all doctors and we're all uh, healthcare workers and we always pretended that we know everything when actually we don't know anything. We don't know anything. Absolutely. And that's the reality. And sometimes because of that ego, we tend to provide wrong information to the public. And we often, the healthcare workers are the one misleading to the public. Of course, there are many healthcare workers, you know, I visited a number of countries who have a, some, who believes COVID is a conspiracy theory. It's not real. But imagine, you know, if we as healthcare workers or the doctor whom people come to get information is the one actually propagating this wrong information. I think it's a responsibility of the government, a responsibility of the academia, if it means all of us, public health, we really need to play our role just to make sure that how we can provide the most accurate information. Of course, I have to admit that there's so much information that we don't know is still on COVID. And we are still learning every day there's a new information, but at least what we know, the basic information, what are the transmission methods? What are the symptoms? What are the risk factors? What are the ways that we can prevent, the ways that we can slow down the transmission? I think these are the basic information people need to know. And I think we lost so many people unnecessarily just because of our ignorance and because of our ego. Yeah. And the only way to overcome is, of course, we really need to focus on healthcare workers but not only healthcare workers, Dr. Salman, also I will challenge you that also, I think we also need to challenge, we need to target the leaders, the government, whether it's a government leaders, whether it's a community leaders, whether it's a religious leaders. I think this um, also an, another group of influencers to the public because there is a challenge, there is a competition for those who believe COVID and those who doesn't believe COVID. And I think in many countries, those who doesn't believe COVID and those who undermine actually are winning. The, 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 the war. So I think we really need to put in a parallel, you know, uh, campaign where we really need to target healthcare workers because we lost so many of our colleagues unnecessarily. Dr. Because Dr. Basic, yeah. basic yeah. IBC, public, uh, you know, preventive, uh, infection preventive measures. Absolutely. Basic, you know, uh, BB is how to use. So these are the things that we really need to do. I think we need to put our hand together and produce something, some packages that are easy to communicate and uh, reach the people. Dr. Adham, there is a question from Dr. Safa uh, Kassous from uh, uh, Safa al Kassous from uh, Al-Ardun. Al uh, sorry, from Jordan. I, I shifted this to Arabic. I apologize. And uh, uh, it's a very practical question that all the schools will be open uh borders will be open wedding and uh, big gathering uh, will be continue etc a what would be the impact especially now we have seeing the infection started to spread among the young people actually in the uk almost all the infection under 25 by the way and hence the strict measures reintroduced today in the uk they are preventing gathering more than six people, six people. And they increase the penalties in an unbelievable way, you know? Yes. 
and they introduce uh, what is called COVID marshals, the new force, which they will go on the street and check that people comply with it. Dr. Yeah. Adan? We're missing that in Iraq, actually, Dr. Salman. And I wish we had COVID marshals uh, here in, in Iraq as well. I can assure you it will be a, a steady income for the, for the, <laughs> for the government. <laughs> they are both fines. Many are not in line. But this is a topic, uh, and I thank Dr. Safa for the uh, question, because this is a topic we've discussed in the, uh, up in the higher safety, the higher committee for safety and health. I actually proposed that to His Excellency, the Prime Minister, that that we should discuss that. Uh, UNESCO is working with us, uh, with WHO, on this, uh, on this file. We have come up with uh, some framework that, uh, that definitely would look into many things because lucky thing is that children have high immunity and they are not, and when they are, even if they are infected, they are mild or asymptomatic. But the problem is that they can transmit the disease to their families and also to the uh, teachers at school. So that is the, and they can be, you know, at high risk, both of them. So therefore, what we are saying is that we have many solutions. The government is saying the online is not practical in Iraq. It can be done at certain, but it cannot be done for all students because of obvious limitations in, in ICT equipment. And therefore, what we are saying is that we could, at least the schools should not be crowded. Every child should have at least two meters from all sides. PPEs should be available for all for all teachers, uh, and we have so many ideas that we can discuss with the uh, His Excellency, the Minister of Education. So I think this is a file that we need to sit down. I told uh, the Prime Minister that we need to discuss that, but he uh, postponed it to the next meeting to become more prepared. So I am uh, calling our UNESCO colleague to start, but definitely less curriculum, less number of students, less uh, learning hours at school if the need be. Uh, and and, and, and uh, so th these are general things that we agree on. If possible, there is an online, we will do it. If not possible, then we have to take extreme measures in bringing uh, the children. There are some issues that you cannot escape like uh, uh, general education, uh, like you know, uh, uh, high school uh, exam, what will you do? These are things that you have to deal with and you have to take your measures. So we need to go into the nitty uh, gritty details as they are saying. And, uh, and this, uh, this warrants a big meeting that we are expecting in the next week. But we do have a general idea and we work with UNESCO on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Khodja, uh, quick question and short answers from colleagues. Carry on. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, Professor Man. Thank you, Your Excellency. Dr. Adham and Dr. Abdi Nasser. This is an excellent, really, presentation about the past and the present and situation analysis. Uh, I have two particular questions. Uh, the first one is uh, for both you, and the second one is for Dr. Abdi Nasser. Uh, the question is what to do in the vision that we cannot do all what has been advised by public health measures. We cannot sustain for this one. Uh, it is a human behavior, human um, uh, uh, character. So I, I, I want from WHO uh, to, to advise us. Uh, there is economic burden, there is people frustrated, there is mental illness, there is breakdown, there is a divorce, there is a lot of things coming up from, from Corona. So we cannot sustain this. So what is yes. the advice? The second question is, uh, uh, for uh, this will bother you, but uh, for uh, Dr. Abdel Nasser, uh, is the Emirat Division Regional Office has a framework for a roadmap for the states members that they need to adhere or to address for the second wave. I mean now for oh, the second wave. For second wave, we, we understand that every country in the first wave they do everything they try uh, try and effort. Uh, uh, success or failure, and you uh, But now I think we have experience. Six months. So the will show is the uh, the house uh, uh, of intelligence, house of uh, expertise. They should advise, uh, and really I want to know what is the frame and what is the component for the second wave uh, uh, facing the crisis of second wave. If it happened last month. 
Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Dr. Tofi. I was on TV two days ago, on national TV, and I said, we have to have someone who's specialized in behavioral change science and, 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 and integrate these, these sciences into our messages and communication strategies. I think people are fed up. I think people do not want to wear masks anymore. They want to go back to their old lives. Uh, you would be surprised, doctor, to know that even my staff, they do weddings without informing me and they get infected. And really, I'm not joking. And these people are attending WHO uh, sessions every day. This is a human behavior. So I was surprised to know that, and many of them hide in their homes, claiming it's an annual leave without even going and being tested. So the things that we criticize, my stuff, national stuff is doing. And I think, I think we need to relook at the way we are communicating our messages in the media. I think we have to, to, to follow a different path. The human behavior, Dr. Tafi, started with complete fear in Iraq, complete compliance because they were afraid. And that managed in the first few months. Then total negligence and total uncompliance that has led to catastrophic results. And guess what? They don't care. When they tell them the number of infections is rapidly rising exponentially, they just don't want to wear the masks anymore. That's it, period. Only 30% of the people of Iraq and in the most infected uh, uh, places, doctor, wear masks. The rest, they just don't, you hand him the mask, he takes it, put it in his pocket, doesn't want to wear it. And you tell him, if you get sick, you'll not even be able to earn money. He doesn't care. This people attitude should change. And I think we need people who are specialized in sociology, in behavioral change, to, to, to sit at the table with WHO and repurpose their communication strategy because right now, in all honesty, the strategy we are dealing with in terms of communication is not working. Over next week, uh, to assure you, Dr. Adham, next week's session is on behavioral changes. Yes. And we will bring some scientists on, on, on that important issue. And I'm very pleased you raised it. Uh, uh, Dr. Abdi Nasser? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I think it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a very good question, actually. And, for the last few weeks, this was this has been the most common questions asked by WHO uh, by the member states, and I think our DG and as well as the, our RD have, you know, addressed this issue a number of times. And I think the key issue that we need to understand is what exactly do we mean second wave or second peak, whatever you want to call it. Actually, the terminology may vary from one to another, but the point is when we have the first peak and when we have the second peak. The issue is we, the outbreak and the virus is spreading to the community. And all what we need to do is we need to do the basic, as we have done before. I think Atham have rightly said that Iraq, at the beginning, they really did a great job. You know, they really put together a very intensive intervention, public health interventions, social measures, the testing, and everything. They, and they managed to control. But suddenly, things went in different direction. And now what we need to do is we really need to go back to the same interventions. And what we need is we really need to maintain the same you know, testing uh, capacity and te same testing strategy. We need to test more. We need to identify who has the virus. And if we find those people, we need to isolate them. And if we need to find them, we need to find the contacts, those people who have contact. And we need to quarantine them. We really need to see how we can limit or slow down the spread. This is the... It's not a rocket science. It's a basic epidemiology. You know, you have a, for example, I will give you an example. I think my colleague Habiba might know better than in Tunisia, Morocco, Jordan. The reason why we have the second wave or the resurgence is because international travel or maybe mass gathering or maybe, you know, uh, uh, no isolation. It's, we failed to implement some of the key interventions. That's why we face. I think Tunisia and Morocco is a good example because of the international travel. And that's, the, uh, that's why the virus has been reintroduced to some communities. And then it has spread. If you don't have a proper contact tracing, if you don't have a proper isolation, if you don't have a proper you know, uh, case management, and I think this is what, you, what you're going to face. At the same time, also social uh, measures. We really need to, I'm not advocating we need to have a strict lockdown that we had four years, four months, six months ago. 
I know the economic, uh, the balance of economy and, the, and, and public health, but I think it, there are some lessons. We have a number of countries globally in the region that have really opened up, but also at the same time, they really maintain a very strong social measurement. As you rightly said, Dr. Salman, why not, you know, and uh, COVID marshals to remind people that they really need to follow the public, the social measures. Very simple physical distancing. I think I, you know, I visited one of the restaurants on the weekend and everyone has stared on me that because I'm wearing masks, they think that I'm, uh, is, I'm strange. This is the way we are. People, of course, they are, there is a fatigue. There is a, 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 a big community are not accepting about this. It's taking long, but as we said earlier, COVID will be with us, not only now, but for years to come. But it's up to us how we behave and how we react and what we need to do it. I think in short, the answer is second wave, what we need to do is the same as what we did in the first phase, in the first wave. But we need to do more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's great. I think I think we need to do more, but we need to be specific in terms of what we need to do more, uh, Dr. Abdi Nazar. We have two questions quite similar or overlapping from two prominent professors in our region, Professor Nanir uh, at tawil and uh, Professor Lubna Al-Ansari. It's related that, that uh, uh, Professor Nanir saying that uh, I think death rates per million is very important indicator. And Dr. Lubna added to that, uh, Professor Lubna, in saying that this is good news while the cases, uh, number of cases going up, mortality is not. And this is, by the way, uh, uh, observed across the region that, uh, for example, in Iraq, uh, when they have 1,000 cases, they have about 70, 70 to 80 uh, death, reported death. Now reaching 5,000, they have still about 80, 70 death. So the death rate is low. And I think that is simply because of the improvement in clinical care, uh, cl clarity about protocol. Uh, there is not that chaos clinicians prescribe as they like. One give hydroxychloroquine, they give this or that, etc. So there is much more clarity about treatment. Uh, any view, Dr. Habiba, from your angle? Actually, it's, yes, it's a good indicators, but also uh, death rates and the, the number of uh, person uh, in the ICU is also uh, are also good indicators to uh, for the surveillance of the epidemic. But I would like to come back to Adham and the uh, okay. inter intervention. The problem. In Tunisia, the Nasser said that is the international travel uh, in Tunisia and Morocco. Yes, it's uh, uh, international travel, but, but also the human behavior. They don't respect any measures. And I, I would like to come back to the intervention of Adam. It's a catastrophe. It's the, the, the uh, human behavior, population behavior in our country is a very, very uh, big challenge. We have to, to, to do something and to, to do uh, something. Uh, for the, to, to know the, the, um, the what have to, we have to do during the second way, uh, my question is to have the answer about the policy of testing and especially for the contact tracing. It's not clear for the population. Uh, even for the, uh, some members of the scientific committee, who, uh, what, what large is the contact tracing? Uh, so say, uh, some, they, they, as they say that we have to just test the uh, persons with symptom. So uh, I would like to have your, your response about the uh, contact tracing, the policy of contact tracing, because it's very important. Hmm. Abdi. Thank, thank you, Dr. Habiba. I think it is a valid point. And by the way, as we are entering in the second phase of the epidemic or the pandemic, contact tracing is one of the most important interventions. The countries who are maintaining low level of transmission, they really need to identify the new infections. Not only the new infection, but also we need to identify the contacts of those new infections. 
because this is the way that you can limit the spread. And if you identify the contacts, you need to quarantine them and make sure those people don't uh, intermingle with others. And if you do that, you will be able to maintain. And that's why so, you know, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, New Zealand, and many of the countries that have control, they just have a very good contact tracing. For, I'll give you an example in Tunisia and Morocco. If when you open the international travel and you have people coming from overseas and you don't have a proper screening at the airport and you let people go home without having a proper monitoring mechanism, what can you expect? This is where the contact tracing you really need. You have a, someone who came from the US into Tunisia, you need to follow up that person until 14 days to make sure it's healthy. If you test someone at the airport and it's negative, that doesn't mean that the, you, you, it's free from the virus. No, that's why we really need to follow up until the incubation period. So contact tracing, it's a, one of the most important as we're entering to the second phase, as we're entering countries are trying to control the epidemic. I think the contact tracing is one most of the important uh, uh, interventions need to be implemented. And if you really do a good policy, you will succeed. It. Of course, you have to do some others as well. Yeah. I mean, you are absolutely right. Last week I traveled across Europe and uh, every time I go to a place, I have to register my name. And before I return to Britain 48 hours, I must complete a form. And now I'm under quarantine for two weeks. I can, although I'm exempted, but still, I actually uh, uh, follow the rule very strictly. We have actually many questions, but one, one, uh, one uh, and we have only about three minutes. Uh, from Professor Ali uh, Abutheen, uh, uh, very practical question. He's saying, uh, we think the number is not accurate reflection of what's happening in reality, because people choose what to publish, uh, choose uh, to reveal figures and in many countries some of the infection is by far much widespread than publicized i know this is a very very question you know but it's in 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 in, in pandemic we have to be honest and sincere we have yeah. to be accurate to the last dot Otherwise, it will be reflect on the people. Quick, quick responses, uh, Adam. What I can assure you, Dr. Salman, and thank you for the question, because this is something uh, that you, you all have to know that when we were reporting low numbers and there were millions of cases in the US and Europe, I had, I had reporters from everywhere coming and calling me saying, you're hiding the numbers in Iraq. Now we we're reporting thousands, no one is calling me. So we were transparent and we showed that we're transparent, but that doesn't exclude the fact that there are underreported and there are people who are not coming forward and there are people who are hospitalizing themselves at home or treating themselves at home on a parallel system. Some of them are the private clinics, by the way, who are trying to treat people and give them medications at home. And without reporting it to the authorities. Without reporting to the authorities. So this, is, this is a crime by itself yeah. under international yeah. law. And we are sure in WHO that the numbers are higher than this, but are they four times, five times, 10 times? We don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. But those recorded, I can assure you that we have three tracks to, to uh, uh, three parallel tracks to double check the numbers in Iraq. And I have to give them the, uh, uh, the credit for, for that. I have the official MOH track. I have my people on the ground collecting data and I have our geographic information system people and the three coincide every day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 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 Abdi, 30 seconds, the last 30 seconds for you. Yeah. Thank you. I think this, this, you know, in the pandemic, this is one of the most complex and very important question and information. And I think in WHO, from the DG to the regional director to WRS, this is the one of the messages where continuously we are bombarding to the countries. Please make sure that you report. Please make sure you share information. But I have to admit that, as Atma, Atma my colleague, have said that it's not hundred percent. But also there is no major, you know, uh, 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 hiding of information by the countries. That has been shared with WHO and countries are reporting, but it's not what we 
what we think. What you expect. Yeah, yeah. It's what we expect. Some of them. There is not testing. Yeah. Secondly, probably the government is not reporting, but I think we really need to promote this transparency and information sharing and cross-border collaboration. Abdi, I'm grateful. Thank you very much indeed. We reached the end and uh, really I enjoyed thoroughly the day and uh, I'm so grateful uh, I and uh, Professor Khoja on behalf of the Arab Public Association. Thank you very much, your Thank excellence. You. Thank, Thank you, you, professors. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very your much. Your excellency, um, um, Habiba, uh, professor. We discuss behavioral changes in the community. And the week after that, Dr. Hanan will be with us with her team from WHO. I, went, I won't miss I, that, I, Professor I, Salman. I won't miss that, that session for the world, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.